Great, great. Excited to be here. Um, I'm actually going to be sharing this presentation with Aaron, and um, Aaron will introduce himself when he gets up here. I'm going to probably go through my portion fairly quickly, and then we'll jump into to Aaron's portion. So um, just to let you know my background, um, so I'm the, the um, managing director of the I2B2 Foundation um, at this point. I've been in um, healthcare for longer than I probably want to talk about, um, but I was the CIO at a hospital for a decade and then moved into a corporate position for Partners Healthcare and created a, the research computing um, department that managed the, the, the vast research organization at, at Partners. And so what I wanted to do a little bit, because um, I really wasn't exactly sure the questions that people would have, but give you a little bit of history about ITV2, kind of where it came from, and really focus on the adoption, because I think that's really um, important to understand the community and the size of the community. And then um, Aaron will jump in and, and um, talk about the synergies between um, ITV2 and Transmart. So, the landscape before I2B2 at Academic Medical Centers. Is anybody here from Academic Medical Centers? A few people? Yeah. So. We have a few, yeah. <laughs> All right. So, so the landscape, you know, if you tried to get support out of the IT department to support research, it was, it was, really, it was really hard. They were, they were kind of busy doing other things. And so um, the research uh, community was, was really on their own to figure out how to get data out of the system. So things like support for data extracts and that type of thing to, um, to do feasibility studies and those types of things was just really non-existent. Um, you know, they, they often would get access to the clinical systems and literally we would call it trolling, troll through the records to try to find patients to, to um, recruit for, for trials and, and various things. Um, so um, all bad things, the privacy HIPAA people you know, also hate that. Um, the data is messy. Everybody knows the data. I said the data was messy. The data is still messy. Um, so that was really hard. And, and often you need to understand the workflow of the clinical environment before you even know what you're looking at. So all of that was, was there. So things like, again, feasibility studies, patient recruitment, and, and um, large-scale clinical data analysis was time-consuming and hard. Um, they, they, they didn't even have a, a, in, a adequate infrastructure to allow research to, researchers to store their data that often contain PHI. And so um, the HIPAA and privacy people went really crazy. And, and this is actually one of the reasons we finally got a little bit of funding to support research is because people are worried about the, um, the security is issues. Um, and the thing that, that I, I noticed was um, a lot of these studies, really, the, the requests were very, very similar. People needed a lot of the same data, the demographics and diagnosis and a, a lot of this, the, the basic stuff. But we never really leveraged that. Everybody was like starting over um, and everything was very, very silent. So at uh, Mass General Hospital, Lab of Computer Science, in um, about 1999, they had a little bit of money um, to, to, to create sort of a pilot project. And, we, and so this was the RPDR. And this was to create um, a de-identified data warehouse to allow the researchers to finally query for their own data. Um, and then if they had IRB approval, they were, they were able to return data sets. So this, was, this, this, this happened and this turned into a pretty big thing and it was pretty valuable to the organization and it was the crown jewels of, uh, of partners healthcare. Everybody um, sort of coveted this. Um, it had a, a very intuitive, very easy um, user interface, very, very little training. People could set up their queries, drag and drop. Um, and it grew over time. It started with you know, just basic information and it, it grew over time. Fast forward, five years, 2004. So Harvard was awarded one of the, um, the four um, NCBC grants. It was a quite a, a large grant that I think covered like five years. And um, this was the sort of the birth of I2B2. So, Informatics for Integrating Biology in the Bedside, if you ever cared about what I2B2 stand, stood for. Um, and this was a big grant that did, uh, it had three separate cores that did a number of different things. One of the cores was to develop software for organizing clinical data that's optimized for clinical research. Um, and it also said it was going to do things like allowing the integration of clinical data, uh, trials data, and genomic data. Um, and, and the point was that it was going to be a portable and an, and an extensible um, application framework that, um, that allowed people to develop um, plugins. So this was the thing that, that, um, that kind of actually took off a, a, out of this grant, which was a, a, a wonderful thing. Um, Again, it had a, a nice um, web client that allowed um, people to um, 
to uh, interrogate um, data. And then they also said maybe we need to dig a little deeper. So there's a workbench um, function within I2B2 that allows you to take a deeper dive into the clinical data. So if you need to look at the timeline of when certain things happened or you, you need to take a, a look at images or maybe even read patient notes, um, this workbench um, is available. Um, and this is just an example of a plug-in. So this is at, at, at partner, again, at partners, they had a, a genomic um, plug-in um, from their, um, their biobank. I'm going to spend a lot of time on that. I think that the point that, that I want to make, and then I'm going to let um, Aaron introduce himself and get started, is just the adoption. This is an outdated slide, but so all, there's not enough dots on this, um, missing some key ones, but it's, it, it's pretty saturated within the U.S. People are, people are using it because it's open source, because it's, um, it, it's um, uh, something that finally allows organizations to, um, to support their research community, and it's also uh, starting to really take off in Europe. Um, here's a better, not, your, not that you're going to read this, but here's a better slide, and again, this isn't complete because um, unless they register with us, we don't even know if they're using the software, but um, it's used at the majority of the CTSAs across the, the U.S., um, so that's on the, the left side. The right side is academic medical centers that are not part of CTSAs, so uh, quite a few um, are using it. Um, HMOs are, are starting to, to use it a bit. There's definitely companies. I have just a few listed. There's certainly more that have, um, have uh, downloaded the software and have, have used it. Um, and in the international market is starting to, to really um, grow. They've, there's a user group meeting um, in Italy that's, um, that's really active and, um, it, it, and, and really growing. Um, so that was my kind of entree into history and the user community, and I'm going to turn this over to Aaron. Thanks. My name is Aaron Abend. Um, I, uh, actually, when I uh, started working with Sean Murphy at, uh, on the RPDR project in 1999, I believe you were Sean's boss at that point. Right, yeah. Um, I was uh, co-founder of Recombinant Data, which developed Transmart. So that's one of the reasons I'm here. I'm just interested in how it's going. And, um, but I've continued to work with I2B2 and clinical data. Uh, I'm actually starting an autoimmune registry, a national autoimmune registry, which is a nonprofit that I'm doing uh, as a side project. But uh, let me just talk to you. I'm here to talk about the I2B2 system and how it's used at academic medical centers and how that relates to the work that's done with, uh, by people uh, who are using Transmart, because there's two different worlds there. Uh, just a couple of other things about features of I2B2 that make it important and relevant. One is this uh, concept of the smart application, which is a way of adding features to I2B2 to look at clinical data on the fly. Now, I don't know too many people who are actually using this technology. I know Children's Boston is using it, but it's something you might want to take a look at. It's part of the I2B2 infrastructure. The second thing, more important, is SHRINE. You probably all know what it is. It stands for the Shared Health Research Informatics Network. It is not a thing. It is a technology. You can't join the shrine. Some people think you can. Um, but what you can do is you can install it and then connect to people who have also installed it, assuming you can configure it. Not simple, but it has been done. Uh, what happens is you get I2B2 running at your installation. You get a data warehouse, a de-identified I2B2 system, and you, you work with I2B2. You find a couple of other institutions that are also working with I2B2, and you all install Shrine, and then when you launch a query at your institution, it's federated to the other sites, and you get aggregate data back. You don't get patient data back, but you do get the aggregate count. So if you're trying to find the, you know, the, the 30 people within the University of California system that have a particular phenotype that you're looking for, the UC Rec system which is five I2B2 systems that are connected together, including the one here at UCSD. That is one of the shrines that exists where you can query a very large population. So what I2B2 has is, uh, as uh, Diane showed in her slide that showed how much, how much adoption there is, especially among the academic medical centers, we've got phenotype, okay? We don't have a lot of genotype data in these I2B2 systems, but if you're looking for sick people, these are the databases that can tell you where to find sick people. And you need sick people because you're trying to run a clinical trial to get drugs tested. 
So there's a, actually a program that's been launched within the context of the CTSA called Accrual to Clinical Trials, the ACT Network. Uh, you know, you, this is a, a statistic you probably heard. 20% of uh, phase two and phase three, phase three cancer trials reviewed between 20, 2005 and 2011 never completed, due, most often due to failure to uh, accrue patients. ACT Network, the ACT Network is going to use I2B2 to build out a, a large shrine that runs across the CTSAs. Now, people have been talking about this for years. I think it might happen. Um, and they're, all, they're also going to use a technology, a platform called Research Match, to try to find, to help patients find the research opportunities to partic for participation. Um, now, the clinical data that's in I2B2 systems, it's really bad data. And one of the reasons it's really bad is that when a, from a quality perspective, and this is related to what Marcy was talking about this morning, it's the, the data is collected for billing. It's not collected to make patients healthier. So it's collected to collect money. So that's one of its problems. But, you know, it's, at least we've got lots of it. It's bad data, but we've got lots of it. So you get a large network. Uh, there are privacy concerns in terms of using it, and that's where I2B2, again, because it just gives you an ability to get aggregate counts, most IRBs will let researchers query that data without a specific hypothesis. So you can do some hypothesis testing. If you think people with a particular phenotype who have a particular ICD-9 code, a particular disease, uh, taking a particular drug, are going to have a particular uh, result, maybe a lab test, you can go into I2B2 and query those three things and find out if there are patients who have taken that drug and had that problem. And if you get a count of zero, you know that either you have a bad hypothesis or the data is bad. It's probably the latter, but um, at least you can find out. And you could if these uh, background system, if all the infrastructure is set up, you could go and try to recruit those patients through an honest, honest broker process that I'm not going to get into. So um, actually, this is part of my slide this morning, CDRNs and PPRNs. That's already been covered by Marcy, so I'm not going to go into that. Um, some of the registries in the Ag Network have recruited up to 10,000 patients for clinical trials, and um, the UC REC system is a model. I will say, Jay Shah's presentation this morning, is he in the audience right now? That, that is the perfect combination of I2B2 and Transmart. I couldn't, th couldn't have done, come up with a better example of how to do the integration. So I would take a look at that, uh, at that work. Um, one of the things to understand about I2B2, because it's, it's hyped up a lot, it's a really a very th simple tool for counting patients. Uh, let's say you've got a patient population of a million. I2B2 will get that down to 5,000 that you might be interested in talking to. Then you might use the annotation cell, which is a lightweight NLP thing that's part of I2B2, to get it down to 100. And then you're going to do chart review to find the last 25. And these are just you know, rough numbers. But I2B2 isn't going to solve, the whole, you know, solve any problems from start to finish just sitting there using the, the thing. It's one step, one very important step, in a very long process. And you're at the end of that process because you're doing the research with the patients. Um, patients. They're at the center of all this. This is a set of slides I, I had used when I was at Recombinant, and I'm just, it just seemed to be very relevant to what we're doing, and I'm going to wrap up with this. The translational research flow starts with patients who are sick. They've got a problem. They are coming to hospitals. They're going to their doctors. They're going into clinics. They've got problems. We want, that, we want to study them. We want to find out what's wrong with them. We want to see if we can help them. For that, we do tests. We do some research. We might collect data, uh, molecular data, genomic data. We capture that data. We make the discoveries, come up with medications and procedures that can then be used to help those patients. And Transmart was part of the software. So this is translational research software that supports each of those, each part of that process. And ideally, when you get to the end of this process and you've, you've got your uh, the drug that helps with a particular phenotype, you can go back into your I2B2 system and say, who should we contact to provide this medication or treatment to? And have some idea of how to help those people. So uh, that's it.